Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Games for Learning. This is the welcome video for the spring 2022 semester, so if you're watching in a different year, this is the wrong video. As the title would suggest, this course is intended as an introductory survey to the topic of games, play, learning, and teaching. Obviously, this is a highly interdisciplinary topic, so there is a lot of ground to cover and different perspectives to consider. And based on past experience, I know that you and your classmates in this course are similarly coming from a very diverse range of backgrounds, both as educators and as gamers. I expect there are a couple of lifelong gamers who can probably teach me a few things about the medium this semester. And I also expect a few people who have pretty much never been interested in playing games before now. And a lot of people somewhere in the middle. So, the challenge I had in designing this course was to try to accommodate all this breadth of experience and different perspectives and different goals within the fields of game design and the learning sciences, and within the student body of the course. And fortunately, games are fantastic at doing just that, allowing for different combinations of elements and strategies leading to unique outcomes. This welcome video is meant to provide some context for the development and design of the gamified course and the praxis of bringing together game design and learning, which is, of course, what you are all here to do as well. The details of how things are set up can be found in the course syllabus and on the Blackboard homepage, so if you haven't already, read the syllabus first before you continue with this video. This is more about the why of the different design features of the course. I want to explain a bit about the ideas and goals that went into the gamification process so that you know what to expect this semester, and also so that you will be prepared to criticize and evaluate for yourself whether this example of gamification actually delivers on what it sets out to do. First, in the interest of giving you full background, let me just introduce myself quickly. I'm Sturdy, your instructor, pictured here with my co-author. I'm the one on the right, just to be clear. Also, here is a little background about me. I don't want to give too much away up front, but that should at least give you some clues on how to ultimately defeat me in the final boss battle at the end of the semester. One further note on communication. I think that the most awkward thing in all of education is not knowing how to address the instructor. So, to be clear right now, I prefer a first-name basis, just call me Sturdy. This is a graduate course, so while I am the one designing and moderating the discussion, as far as I'm concerned, this is really a conversation among colleagues. If you absolutely can't get comfortable being on a first-name basis, I will respond to any of these alternative titles as well, but really my first preference is just first-name basis, call me Sturdy. Okay, so enough about me for now. We have the rest of the semester to get to know each other better. Let's talk about Introduction to Games for Learning. The one-minute elevator pitch for the design of this course boils down to this. I want to create interesting decisions for you, which means creating legitimate alternatives, which are choices where there's no single correct option, but you can legitimately choose your own unique path and still be successful by the end of the course. So choosing your own path is the cornerstone idea of the course design, what game designers call the core engagement, the essential experience that I want players to have in this game. And the way I've tried to design for that core engagement is by creating so much extra content, so many legitimate alternatives, that any one piece feels totally optional because at any point you can easily choose an alternative way to earn your points and move on to the next piece. But 
the cost of that design decision is a lot more added complexity. There's just a lot more information you have to sift through in order to make those choices. So I've added some other gamification mechanics to help you navigate that complexity and help make these decisions interesting rather than overwhelming. And this video is about explaining the design goals and the process behind those mechanics of levels, guilds, and quests. So without further ado, let's get into it. So let's start off talking about levels, because this, I think, is the most prominent gamified feature of the course in terms of your day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week experience this semester. All the course content is organized by levels, which are pretty similar to traditional modules or lesson units with two key differences. One, levels don't begin on any predefined schedule. You unlock them yourself by earning 100 experience points, or XP in gamer language. And two, once unlocked, levels don't end until the last day of the semester. So there are no hard deadlines during the semester itself. You can hand in any work from any level at any time for full XP up until May 4th. The idea is to create opportunities for you to explore the ideas that most interest you within the boundaries of each level and the course overall. This overall design structure is borrowed from role-playing games and is sometimes called a lakes and rivers, or alternatively a string of pearls, design. Basically, it's a series of mini, mostly open areas where you can move around pretty freely inside each one, and then they are connected to each other by more linear parts that serve as gates between each area. In an RPG, these might be boss battles or puzzles or story elements that the player has to resolve to get from one level to the next and unlock the next part of the game. In this course, the levels alternate between those more open content zones with lots of different options for readings and games and challenges, and milestone levels that have much more limited options and act like those gates between the stages of the course. Level mechanics are tools designers use to break up a game into distinct areas, but they can also be used to scale difficulty and complexity based on players' knowledge of the game. Especially in a game that's designed to be played over a long time, like this course, which takes about three and a half months, both you and I need a way to track your progress between now and May 4th, which is where the milestones and the overall sequence of the levels comes in. Another way to model this design is in terms of widening the decision space of a game over time. At the beginning, you have a fairly narrow decision space that gives you a few choices, but not too many. And then as you level up and gain more knowledge, you'll unlock more options and have to make more complex choices in a wider and wider decision space until by the end of the game, you unlock all the possibilities and you can fully decide what you want to do within the limits of that system. And the gates or milestones act as sort of a proficiency test, a way to make sure that you've learned what you need to at the end of each level and that you're ready to make those more advanced choices going forward. Milestones are also my opportunity to get feedback from you about how things are going and to offer suggestions and guidance if you want them. We'll talk a lot more about feedback and the idea of decision space in the first couple of levels of the course, but even with all this structuring and the milestone checkpoints dividing your choices up into more manageable chunks, I know this is still a lot to process, so I used another mechanic to help you with setting your goals and comparing your options, which is... Guilds. Almost every challenge this semester will belong to one of these three guilds, and you can track your XP in each individual guild as well as your overall total in the Blackboard Grade Center. This is another mechanic borrowed from RPGs, usually called Character Class or just Class, but I want to avoid confusion between class in that sense and class in the academic sense, so I'm using the term guild to mean the same thing. 
So a class or a guild is a way for a designer to package a set of game options together through a relatable archetype that kind of sums up an overall approach to gameplay. Like in a fantasy game, players might choose between playing as a warrior who's tough and uses a sword, or a thief who's fast and uses a bow and arrow, or a mage who's intelligent and uses magic spells. And each of these represents a legitimate alternative to playing and winning the game with a different set of tools and overall style of play. In our case, the three guilds of Crafter, Trader, and Trainer are similarly based on different styles or perspectives on designing games for learning. Those three threads are outlined here, but what it all boils down to is the order of operations for making instructional decisions and game design decisions. Obviously, in this course, we're here to do both of those, but everyone's design process in this area is different. You can outline one and then add the other, or try to balance both at the same time. On one end, we've got the Crafter Guild, which is for those of you who already have a pretty set design for your classroom and your curriculum. You've already locked in those design choices, and you aren't really looking to go all the way into reimagining it all inside a virtual game. But you'd like to learn about using ideas from game design to make specific modifications to your existing classroom environment through gamification. At the other end, we have the Trainer Guild, which is for those of you who want to learn about using existing games as learning environments, whether that's full virtual world games like Minecraft or Age of Empires, or tabletop or board games like Dungeons & Dragons or Wingspan. They're all complete, fully designed systems that you can pull off the shelf and use as frameworks within which to build your own unique lessons and learning objectives. And then in the middle, we've got the Trader Guild, which is a little less focused on nailing down concrete design decisions and more about studying the points of connection between game studies and learning design for those of you who want to do an academic survey of the possibilities in Games for Learning before you start committing to defining practical design goals. The guilds are meant as a guide to help you frame your goals in the course and make interesting decisions based on those goals. You can work on challenges in any guild whenever you want. You don't have to commit to just one unless you really feel drawn to do so. In past years, I'd say that probably a bit over half to two-thirds of the class doesn't have a strong guild preference and does a mostly even mix of challenges from all three while the remaining third or so of the class specializes a little more intensely, either because they identify strongly with one particular approach, and or they don't have much use for the perspective of one of the guilds and don't do much work in that guild. So it takes all kinds. Choose whatever path works best for you. There are some benefits to digging into an individual guild track a little more deeply. As I already mentioned, you can track your XP by guild, as well as your overall total, and if you earn enough XP in one guild to get one of these shiny badges, you unlock bonus content exclusive to that guild. The badges and the bonus unlocks are meant to encourage and reward you for returning to earlier levels and revisiting concepts we've learned about with a more experienced, specialized eye. It is pretty much a guarantee that you will earn at least one Journey Badge just by earning enough XP to pass the course. And it's not too difficult to earn all three. That can actually be a good goal to set for yourself if you want to sample the full range of what this course has to offer. And doing so automatically puts you in at least the B range or higher. So some people try to do that. Other people try to go for a Master Badge in one guild, which unlocks some additional bonus content and rewards as well, and is also a good semester goal to set for yourself. So again, you shouldn't feel restricted by the guild mechanic, but it does give you a few distinct options for how you can choose your style and your path through the course. Now, there's a corollary to the principle of creating interesting decisions that sometimes people don't want to make a decision, no matter how interesting it might be. 
most successful games recognize the need to break up decision-making and complexity with moments of relaxation and simplicity. So, for those moments in this course, there's the weekly quest mechanic. Lots of games use quests, which is kind of a catch-all term for any sort of short-term, immediate objective within a larger, more open game. So each week, a new quest will appear on Monday, and if you're ever having trouble deciding what to work on or nothing really appeals to you immediately, the quest will suggest a challenge or two and offer five bonus XP if you finish them by Sunday night when the quest expires. There are 14 quests, one for each full week of the semester, so that's up to a potential 70 bonus XP for all of them. Last year, the median quest completion rate was 6, or just under half, so the typical student was following the suggested options about half the time and choosing their own path the other half. The quests are designed to create something closer to a more typical course layout, with a few assigned readings and one or two assignments due each week, so if that works for you and you like having those regular deadlines to give you a little extra push to keep engaged, then here you go. But if you don't really like that, then you can do your own thing, set your own pace and go in whatever order you want, and you're only giving up five bonus XP that you could just easily earn from choosing something else or completing one extra discussion reply. One thing that I've updated since last year is that the quests can let you bypass the normal unlocking rules for the week if you're falling behind. So all the readings and challenges for the current quest each week are open to everybody even if they're in a level you haven't unlocked yet. So if you do start to fall behind, doing the quests each week will be the best way to catch up and keep current with the rest of the class. Or if you just want to ensure that you don't miss out on anything important and you get to sample the full range of options on offer in the course, the quests amount to my recommended list of games and readings and challenges to get a full, well-rounded perspective on games for teaching and learning. So I hope that gives you a little more context on the design of the course and the intentions behind the mechanics of levels, guilds, and quests. Again, the full details are in the syllabus, so consult that first if you have questions. As you can see, there are a lot of different ways to create decisions, and hopefully one or more of the ways outlined here will be interesting to you this semester. If you still have further questions after watching this and rereading the syllabus, you can ask them on Blackboard or by email. Don't forget to introduce yourself in the Starting Zone forum as well. I look forward to learning a little bit about all of you, and I will talk to you again real soon.